Welcome back everybody to another reaction video and you guys really seem to like when I respond to the armchair historian so I thought I'd take a look at another one of his videos today. Uh, in addition we are going to be continuing the Napoleonic War series tomorrow so be watching for that. Uh, that'll be part three of that series and once we're done with that Napoleonic War series I want to get into another extra credits uh, extra history series. So uh, I've got some options available to our patrons over on Patreon that I'll be posting. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at any one of a number of series. We're either going to take a look at The Hunt for the Bismarck. Uh, we're going to take a look at Admiral Yi, which a lot of you have suggested. Or we're going to take a look at the Articles of Confederation. So uh, if you are a patron at any level, uh, register your vote today and whatever you guys decide will be the next extra history series as soon as we're done with the Napoleonic War series that we're about to continue. So let's dive into this one. This is uh, would D-Day have failed without the Airborne? I'm really curious to hear what he has to say about this and what his, his thoughts and what his reasoning is behind whether he believes it would or would not have failed. And then we'll just kind of respond. I haven't seen this yet, so I don't know what all he's going to say here. In the D-Day Companion, a publication written by leading historians on the subject in question, it is written that, from the World War II era, there is one event, one memory, that transcends national experiences and unites the Western Allies. That event is D-Day, June 6, 1944. The foreword of this book is written by Major Richard Winters, who mm. you've no doubt heard of if you're familiar with the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. Today, we'll be telling the story not just of Winters and his men, but of the other paratroopers who participated in D-Day. In doing so, we'll be answering three primary questions. First, who were the Airborne? Secondly, what was their purpose on D-Day? And lastly, would the invasion of Normandy have failed without them? But first, I'm pleased to announce today's sponsor, Patron Blades. More on that later. Throughout the Second World War, Churchill had inspired his countrymen again and again with his shows of defiance and determination. But even he occasionally had his doubts. And on the eve of D-Day, he could no longer maintain his composure. The following is documented in the D-Day Companion. Remember, this is an invasion, not the creation of a fortified beachhead. With this admonition, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill concluded his address to the Anglo-American High Command. He was in a very weepy condition, looking old and lacking a great deal of his usual vitality, recalled General Alan Brooke, the British Director of Military Operations. Who could blame him? The Allies were pursuing a bold strategy. They could let Germany wither away and wait for the Soviets to make more breakthroughs, or they could strike against the German war machine with a decisive blow while running the risk of being repelled. Ultimately, they chose to enact the latter course of action, a decision which, despite being potentially dangerous or even disastrous, Asterisk made sense. For so one of the things with the D-Day invasion, and one of the things I think that really probably more than any other that Eisenhower grappled with as they were getting ready for this invasion uh, was where to drop the airborne. And there was a strong argument between uh, the commander of the ground forces, uh, I think who was Omar Bradley, um, at least of the American uh, ground forces, and of the... Uh, the guy in charge of the Airborne, who I think was Lee Mallory, uh, who would later be killed in the war, and who's actually the brother of the guy who climbed Mount Everest. The um, argument between the two of them was, do we drop the Airborne close to the beaches where they can have a direct impact on things, or do we drop them further behind enemy lines? And Lee Mallory's concern was that dropping them close to the beaches was going to cause just horrendous casualties. Some estimates were as high as 70% casualties for the airborne if they dropped them close to the beaches. But the infantry and the invasion argument was we need them to be close to the beaches or else they aren't going to be any use to us and they're not going to help us with the invasion landings. So there was a strong debate about that. And Eisenhower eventually came down on the side of we have to drop them close to the beaches. They have to get behind enemy lines, uh, kind of secure the bridges and the and the connection points where the bridges come or where the different beaches come together. Uh, and Lee Mallory was convinced that it was just going to be devastation. But thankfully, it turned out not to be the case. And casualties were much, much lower than the estimates. 
For one, the remnants of the German Navy, the Kriegsmarine, which had once wrecked havoc in the Atlantic, was forced to retreat to safe harbors, no longer in a viable position to stop an Allied fleet from crossing the English Channel. Furthermore, the Luftwaffe, which had once enjoyed air superiority, had by 1943 lost many trained pilots and had continued to use antiquated airframes. It was no longer in a position to stop an amphibious land. But the Wehrmacht, entrenched in what was known as the Atlantic Wall, was still a force to be reckoned with. Its path to the French coast would be hampered by the transportation plan, however, an Allied bombing plan which targeted German infrastructure and effectively disabled the French railroad system. By the time of the invasion, it would make transporting reinforcements very difficult for the Germans. So that part was successful. The part where they prevented uh, reinforcement easily was successful. What was not as successful was the bombing of the fortifications themselves. It didn't have nearly the effect that the Allies expected it would. Uh, I, because of that, there probably could have been some serious doubts about the success of the landings if it hadn't been for a really, really effective disinformation campaign. Uh, the intelligence part of this was phenomenal uh, and can't be understated. So where did the Allied paratroopers fit during all of this? Well, until D-Day itself, they did not play a significant role in shaping the course of the war. In Jonathan Mayo's book, D-Day, Minute by Minute, we learn why this is the case. Airborne forces are a new dimension of warfare. The first parachute regiments in the world were formed only in 1936 as part of the Russian Red Army. The Luftwaffe 7th Air Division soon followed. Its success spurred the British and Americans to follow suit. Thus, the British 6th Airborne Division, along with the American 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, were formed. The 101st and 82nd were created at about the same time, with the former taking the colorful name of the Screaming Eagles Division. That said, the 82nd is not a new division. It's, it's newly formed as part of the Airborne. But the 82nd actually participated in World War I. In fact, um, you know, if you're familiar with Sabaton, you know they have a song called 82nd All the Way, and it's about Alvin York. Alvin York, uh, one of the most well-known World War I soldiers, at least in the American Army, and he was part of the 82nd Division, which at that time was just a plain infantry division, but was switched over to become an airborne division during World War II. In honor of a renowned Civil War division, and the latter taking the more modest name of the All-American Airborne Division. These divisions, along with the British 6th, consisted of elite trained soldiers who were paid more than infantrymen and were armed to the teeth. Twice as Essentially, much. Essentially, these paratroopers would be tasked with dropping behind enemy lines and eliminating batteries, securing roads, and halting the movement of enemy reinforcements. They were meant to distract and confuse the enemy, providing the hard-pressed men on the beaches some relief from German artillery fire. These tasks could not be accomplished by bomber planes, owing to the fact that precision bombing was not sufficiently developed. So I want to back up for just a second. They talked about being elite. And uh, you know, unlike a typical infantry division, a lot of the infantry divisions, for example, were actually National Guard units. Uh, they weren't like regular army units. Um, but unlike a typical infantry division, it was actually really, really hard to get into the airborne. Uh, I think they said for the 506 Parachute Infantry, which is the unit that Band of Brothers uh, focuses on, one of their companies, uh, for the 1,700 men who ended up making up that, um, that regiment when they went into uh, the field for the first time, they, they had 5,000 who went into training. So only about a third of the guys who even signed up and went to training actually made it to the end and became a paratrooper in that unit. The other two thirds didn't, and that included a lot of officers. It was rigorous training. It was difficult. It was difficult physically. It was difficult mentally. Um, and, and a lot of the guys you see the interviews of them, they said, I signed up number one, you know, there was good pay. It was twice the pay of a regular infantry private, for example, but also because I wanted to know that the guy next to me was the best. I wanted to fight with the best, and of course that also meant that you were going to get a lot of the difficult assignments and you were going to have a risk, a higher risk of, of being killed in combat, but that was a trade-off they were willing to make, and it showed. Making boots on the ground an absolute necessity. On June 5th, a few hours before the Day of Days, the paratroopers prepared to prove their abilities in combat. The parachutists got dressed for action a few hours ago. They have to be helped into their planes as they can barely walk due to all of the equipment they carried. 
Some have shaved their heads to make it easier for wounds to be treated by medics. Some have shaved their heads just to look like Mohicans. Yep. Faces are black with soot or boot polish. They want to look invisible and as intimidating as possible. And speaking of shaving, today's video is sponsored by Patron Blades, as mentioned before. Now you might not be parachuting into Normandy anytime soon, but every guy needs a good quality razor to stay clean shaven. One question you might one be now. asking is, why is it called Patron Blades? Well, this service offers you the unique opportunity to support your favorite content creators or charity organizations as 50% of the money from your monthly subscription goes straight to the creator or charity in question. It's you can cool. support the Armchair Historian channel by listing us as the organization you wish to patronize when placing your order. And now, back to the video. Don Malarkey, who served alongside Richard Winters, tells us that Easy Company's flight was largely uneventful. But when crossing France's Cherbourg Peninsula, all hell broke loose. Mm. Big guns thumped below. Searchlights rolled around the clouds, searching for the likes of us. Tracer bullets from anti-aircraft and machine guns zinged through what was now darkness. Fires burned on the grounds from planes that had already been shot down. All I was thinking was, get the hell out of this plane, mm. Malarkey. Then the light turned green and stayed green. I yelled and jumped into the Normandy night. What followed was, for the most part, chaos. The experiences of Jim Walwork and Oliver Boland, pilots of the British 6th Airborne Division, reflect the tumult of the situation. Both were ordered to make crash landings. Upon impact, Walwork and his navigator were flung through the cockpit window, still in their seats. Mm. Everyone else in the plane was knocked unconscious, but Boland was still very much awake. After the plane he had been flying landed and broke in half, he told his stunned men, We're here. Do what you're paid to do. Only so, yeah, I mean, this was a mess. I mean, they're coming in in the dark. The weather's been terrible for the last several days. They get a little bit of a clearing. They come in, they're dropping behind enemy lines. They're scattered all over the place. Units are not where they're supposed to be. Some of them are like as much as 10 miles off of where they're supposed to be. They're in the dark. They're behind, you know, it's just an absolute mess. And, you know, for example, with the 506th, uh, with Easy Company, if you're familiar with Band of Brothers, their company commander's plane gets shot down. Everybody in the headquarters company, at least in that part of the headquarters company, dies. Uh, so they don't even have a company commander. It just could not have been worse. And yet somehow they managed to assemble and, and make something happen. It's an incredible feat. Only a few short seconds before a third plane crash landed behind him. But even though everything did not go according to plan, to say the least, the British 6th Airborne Division carried out all of its objectives and secured the east flank of Normandy by capturing Pegasus Bridge, which crossed the Conn Canal. The 6th provided Allied forces with valuable time to land over Sword Beach. And this is a big deal, these bridges, because uh, the Germans obviously would want these bridges destroyed. And so the, the point of the Airborne was to get there so quickly with enough shock and awe that the Germans don't have time to destroy the bridges and delay the advance. Because if you slow down the advance inland, you give yourself time to bring up reinforcements and maybe push them back off the beach. With ingenuity, initiative, and determination, the 6th Airborne Division had secured the Allied left flank at a cost of 821 dead, 2,709 mm. wounded, and 927 missing about evenly divided the dead and prisoners. The American divisions, meanwhile, tasked with securing the west flank, were hindered by the indecisive command of Generals Bradley, Ridgway, and Taylor. We turn to the D-Day Companion once more to sum up the result. The American Airborne Division behind Utah Beach by the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions remained second only to Omaha Beach, landing in near disaster. Never have so many dropped in so small an area with so little purpose and so much loss. Only the fighting heart of younger officers and sturdy troops saved the operation. Richard Winters, in his memoir titled Beyond Band of Brothers, recalls the following from his landing. Which is a great book, Armed by the with way. with the knife that I had stuck in my boot, I struck out in the general direction where I thought my leg bag had <laughs> landed. Just as I started off, trench knife in hand, another paratrooper landed close by. I helped him cut free from his chute, then grabbed one of his grenades and said, let's go search for my equipment. Although the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions failed to take Carentan in time and did not stop the German 6th Parachute Regiment from launching a counterattack, the Germans were disoriented by their landing and repelled in some locations from strategic choke points. The 101st was able to encircle six artillery batteries of the German 709th Division and kept the infantry of that division distracted until the beaches were stormed. 
In recognition of these efforts, the body of historians whose work we referred to earlier wrote that, no one quibbles about the fortitude and tactical skill of the three Allied Airborne Divisions that participated in Operation Neptune. Thus, we can conclude that, although in all likelihood D-Day would have succeeded without the use of paratroopers due to Germany's disadvantage in the air and at sea, the Allies would have sustained significantly more casualties and their progress would have been slowed. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank my general staff on Patreon. Derek Bellow, Jake Hart, PJ Nave, Eric Greenwood, Joe Crispin, Gibbsy, Fritz, Patrick Reardon, James Thompson, Jim Talbot, Dimitri Stillerman, and everyone else listed on screen. So, yeah, I think I probably agree with him. I wish there had been a little bit more talking about that. I thought he was going to talk more about the topic of whether or not it was succeeded and why. Um, I, I tend to agree that it probably would have succeeded anyway, the landings. But I agree with more casualties, especially on Utah Beach, where uh, you know folks like Winters and his unit that took out uh, Braycourt Manor uh, silencing the uh, the German guns that were firing on Utah Beach probably saved a lot of lives on the beach. And uh, that, combined with the landings happening in the wrong place, actually probably worked to the Americans' benefit. Um, the landings on the beach, I mean. But, uh, yeah, I agree. I think it would have been uglier, it would have been bloodier, and it probably would have slowed down the whole advance if that had happened. Uh, and the Airborne gets to drop again. Uh, the second time they drop, of course, is in... Uh, well, the second time for the 101st, anyway, is in uh, Operation Market Garden, which uh, is a much smoother drop with very few casualties on the drop, but turns ugly pretty fast because it was an ill-conceived attack. Uh, there was another American, I think it was the 17th Airborne, that comes in later in the war. Um, so I'd be curious to, to learn more about the airborne operations during the war. I know what Easy Company did. I'm so familiar with Band of Brothers reading the books and watching the shows, but not as familiar with what the 82nd did during the Second World War or even the 17th or even the British 6th Airborne for that matter. But I'd be uh, curious to dive into more of that at some point. Uh, I am going to be in Toccoa, Georgia in two weeks which is where the guys from the 506th, uh, the, the men who made up what we call Band of Brothers, uh, trained along with a couple of other regiments. I'll be showing you a lot of uh, video from that site. We'll be sleeping in the barracks uh, while we do cleanup work up on Curahi, which is where they uh, trained up and down that mountain, three miles up, three miles down, which I will be doing. I may not live to tell about it, but I am going to do the three miles up, three miles down on foot. So we'll be bringing you along for that journey along with my other videos that will be coming from Georgia in just a few short weeks. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to vote over on Patreon for the next series.